righty then. Hello. And now we shall continue with more about the Spanish Civil War. So we've spoken about the long-term causes. Again, long-term causes are generally things that are um, uh, sort of systematic, institutional, cultural aspects of the, of the state that is going to result in a civil war. And once we start looking at the short-term causes, and these are you know, 10, 15 years from the onset of the actual war, um, we start pinpointing specific events and um, basically looking at how those are going to lead to civil war. All right, so it's probably a really good idea if you get yourself some like note-taking implements um, and take notes with this. This is number six. Oops, I lie. It's number seven. Um, and I should have put that on there, but uh, I forgot. So, um, and it's uh, looking at the short term causes of the Spanish Civil War. I could be lying again. It could be number six. Who knows? We'll see. Obi then. So here are our learning outcomes. First, you need to understand some of the short-term factors that contributed to the eruption of the Spanish Civil War. So basically here, um, what you're looking at, what things, what events um, kind of increase tensions to the point that they're going to break and erupt in war at the immediate cause, right? And so one of the best things to do here is to consider the short-term factors in conjunction with the long-term factors. They do not exist um, separately. The uh, long-term factors contribute to sort of the intensity of the short-term factors. And then you need to synthesize the, the long-term and short-term factors into a coherent argument, and that's what we will be doing at the end. All righty, here we go. So um, what we have, what follows next is essentially an overview of this whole situation, and then we're going to zoom in on two particular, which is the um, Primo de Rivera dictatorship and the Second Spanish Republic. All right. First, basically, um, this bit this builds on the long term factors. As we've discussed the long term factors, we talked about the um, divides that were existing within civil society um, uh, from the last from the previous century onward. And so, what we're saying here is the two governments that preceded the civil war really made things worse. And so, we're going to look at how those two governments made things worse. The Primo de Rivera government, I, got, I think I got a little, a little, a little uh, lazy because the dude's name is Primo de Rivera. Okay, his first name is Miguel, Primo de Rivera, um, served to disrupt the traditional institutions that would have moderated the effects of the Republicans. So we're saying is the Republic government that comes, that in which the Civil War breaks out, was extremely leftist. And the Primo de Rivera government actually disrupted those traditional institutions. We talked about those, like the monarchy, um, church, etc., that would have had a sort of stabilizing influence. So the stabilizing factors were gone. And then what we have happening is the leftist Republican government is quite radical. So again, we have that left-right pendulum shift. And so now we have this Republican government that's come in, going to come in and is going to push a radical shift to the left. And the Civil War is essentially an attempt to move it back to the right. And so the international climate was hostile to a developing democracy. So in looking at everything, we're saying that what was happening internationally in this interwar period was going to make it very difficult for the Republican government to be successful. So what we're looking at is factors other than those that are domestic to the Spanish situation that are going to affect it. So what I would like you to do now is pause the video and um, take a short uh, break to detail, well, maybe not detail, but to outline some of the uh, aspects of the international climate that are going to be um, hostile to a developing democracy and how and why. So this is time for you to review um, a lot of that stuff that we talked about in terms of the interwar period. 
which brings us to discussing Primo de Rivera's dictatorship, which lasted for 1923 to 1930. It wasn't a very long period of time, but it was enough to disrupt um, Spain quite a bit. All right. So basically, um, and this goes into the long-term factors that we've spoken about, right? By the time you get to the 1920s, the government is generally seen by almost everybody to be unreformable because the elites have such power. So the nobility, the landowners, the factory owners have essentially concentrated power into their hands so much that there was no way for people to um, fix the government within the system. And so in 1923, Lieutenant General Miguel Primo de Rivera peacefully took control of the government. And what he said was, our aim is to open a brief parenthesis in the constitutional life of Spain and to reestablish it as soon as the country offers us men uncontaminated with the vices of political organization. So basically, what he is saying here is when he took control of the government is that he wants to just pause, reset the political culture, and then um, get rid of the corruption, and then basically begin new in a constitutional democratic country. So one of the things about this um, declaration of uh, Primo de Rivera's new government is that it was welcomed by people on both sides of the ideological fence. Now, um, in a certain way, the military accepted it because um, Primo de Rivera was a general in the military. Um, and people on the right and people on the left, so people wanting change, people wanting to uh, keep the status quo, both welcomed Primo de Rivera because he was a marquis, that is one step below a duke. So he was of the nobility. And so for the people on the right, it's like he understood, he was a member of their group and he kind of understood what they wanted. And for the people on the left, um, the idea of him pausing and stopping this, this corrupted government to reset and fix things um, was very welcome. They have had, they had had a long period of um, political and social instability. So we have these trade unions, um, we have the anarchists working, we have um, uh, economic problems, we have these high expectations for change, for social change, and uh, the system that was in place at the time was not fixing it. It wasn't answering anybody's problems. So it was a bit of a Hail Mary, you know, um, like people were just like, all right, look, nothing's working. I'll take anything, anything. And so it wasn't so much that people were gung ho into him, but just this idea that, okay, we can have maybe a bit of a fix on some of the problems that we're experiencing. However, as we know, these things, they do not work. Okay, some problems. All right, the, so one of the problems with Primo de Rivera is that he himself was of the nobility uh, and he wielded quite a lot of that elitist power that um, was problematic in terms of the political control of the country, any who's he. And so he saw himself as being like, totally in touch with the needs and wants of the people. He's like, dude, I got this. I know what you need, I know what you want. Sadly, he did not know what people needed and what people wanted because he was so high up, he was totally out of touch. He had no idea what like the extreme abject, the people in abject poverty who barely had enough to eat wanted or needed. The other thing, right, and this is one of the things that helped him um, in have support from the people on the right, is he thought that he was strengthening the Christian base of society. So he's come in and, and he wants to create a Christian society. So in a way, he's inherently conservative, right? And he's going to protect the country against communism. So by the time we get to the 19... Um, 
1920s, the early 1920s, it's a few years after the Bolshevik Revolution. The specter of communism is still, um, is even to today, is very much um, in people's mind in Europe. And keep in mind who he's speaking for, right? The people who would most suffer should there be something like a communist revolution. Um, and so one of the things that he did is he got rid of all of the political parties, right? Because um, uh, they never did anything. They concentrated power into their own hands. So no political parties, he's got this. And so what he did do is he developed his own political party. So as you know, from totalitarianism, it's sort of this uh, attempt to consolidate power. And he created something called the Union Patriota. And so it was um, to try to convince the people that uh, his rule and authoritarian rule was the best way to go. Um, and one of the things, uh, yeah, it didn't work out. It just didn't work out. So one of the things that he did is he had, instead of having um, a parliament and that voting process, he had a cabinet of military officers, um, again, kind of falling back onto his, his roots, so to speak. And then he created an assembly, not a parliament, but basically there was supposed to be an advisory council of different classes and interest groups. So that was his way of, of putting feelers out into the, into the rest of the society and kind of um, trying to answer their needs. Ultimately, ultimately, um, it wasn't enough this Union Patriota and all of the stuff that uh, he was, um, Primo de Rivera said, wasn't enough to sort of act as like a trend, uh, centrifugal um, force that uh, brought people together and unified people. So it wasn't democratic enough to make the people on the left happy, and it wasn't authoritarian enough to stop the problems and make the people on the right happy. And also, um, there just wasn't enough for people to really believe in. The other thing that he did is um, he instituted martial law. Of course, he's in the military, so basically he cancels all of the all of civil rights. Um, it's extreme oppression uh, and oppression to um, suppress civil violence and to um, pacify the Moroccan protectorate. Now, by 1925, he, um, because the, remember we, we talked about before, the General Silvestre, who had gone there before, he um, you know, lost 60% of his troops. But, um, so by 1925, uh, Primo de Rivera had succeeded in terms of pacifying Morocco, which is something that um, a lot of people wanted, you know, as we've spoken about for multiple reasons previously. Um, and so even though he had brought um, uh, order down to society and got Morocco under, under Spanish control again, he didn't um, say close the parentheses, right? He didn't uh, stop the author authoritarian rule and bring back democracy. And so what he did is in 1926, he instituted something called a civil dictatorship and then um, they tried to revise the constitution to make his civil dictatorship uh, permanent. And this parliamentary system officially, uh, uh, officially ended at this point. And the thing is, is that um, Primo de Rivera did attempt to reform. He attempted economic reforms. He attempted social reforms. Um, but by the time he's doing this, it's um, a really tough place for Spain economically. The boom that, that she had experienced during World War I is now kind of like the bust years of post-World War I Europe. And so he didn't have adequate funding. He borrowed a crap ton of money to make things happen, and um, which is going to be problematic. It's going to leave the Republic in debt. And so he tried um, building uh, these huge projects like dams um, to bring electricity. 
and basically infrastructure projects, but they were relatively poorly funded. Essentially, there was so much that the country needed that the limited funds that they had access to wasn't going to be enough. And so this, um, we start having economic problems, right? Because now we've, they've borrowed a lot of money, um, things haven't uh, worked out to the point that he needed them to in order to pay back that money. And so what he has to now do is implement austerity measures, which basically means that the spending which he had been doing before, which essentially had created jobs and, um, and had been working to expand the economy um, and people had been benefiting from that, he had to implement austerity measures and cut that. And so because now he's cut the, the, essentially the social welfare system that people had started getting used to, um, now he's going to have a lot of people angry with him. And the people who are going to be angry with him is everybody. <laughs> because everybody's losing out. And so we have Republicans, students, the press, universities, socialists, even people on the right start attacking him and calling for his, um, his uh, stepping down. He lost support of the military with promotion reforms. As we um, said before, that um, the military, the officer corps, the officer section of the military was in Spain was extremely bloated. So there were way too many officers for the number of soldiers and even the population. And so what he tried doing was actually reducing that. And, um, and people, the military is like, oh, <laughs> oh no, you did not. So they don't wanna lose their privilege. People don't wanna lose their jobs. And so now um, he loses the support of the military, which they weren't full on with him, but they were with him. And so what, what happens is because his economic reforms were, um, were basically dead in the water, even the elite, the people on the right, uh, were hoping that basically with a governmental change, then um, it would sort of eject, inject rather, new life into the system. And so um, there would be uh, confidence in the economy, um, people would invest, and the economy would re re rebound, right? So they were hoping um, to kind of new economic systems, new political system to kind of recreate some of the boom of the um, uh, World War I years. Sadly, um, they did not have the ability to look into the future because it was just not going to happen. Not, not, not. All right. Um, and so... The Primo de Rivera dictatorship was really, really detrimental to, to the monarchy. Already we have a monarchy that is um, pretty much unstable for the various reasons we've spoken about. And then um, the King Alfonso the Thirteenth had given his support to Primo de Rivera. Um, King Alfonso was still the head of state and he had uh, a political power. Not, not just, um, not just, uh, not just like a figurehead the way the current Queen of England is, but he was essentially the head of state, like the president, and um, Primo de Rivera was the uh, was the uh, prime minister, and so what happened because you know they were like best buds. Um, they were both of the nobility, so King Alfonso trusted him more. Uh, what happens is the um, monarchy is linked to this um, breakdown of the constitutional system. And the monarchy is also linked to this dude who jacked up the country even more. So the result is um, increased distrust of the monarchy in addition to what was there before. Um, we have the disruption of the evolution of society under a constitution. So basically, these seven years of Primo de Rivera kind of um, really retarded the development of Spain uh, democratically. So, um, and this is going to mean that it's going to be much more difficult to restart a democratic system again. And 
as people are increasingly unhappy with the Primo de Rivera um, method of management, you have more extreme political climate. So basically we have people are turning toward extremism um, and people are increasingly uninterested in sitting down at the table and compromising with each other. And so um, you should be able to stop now and think about how that is going to help lead to um, the uh, Civil War. And that took a little longer than I expected, so we shall continue with the next Power, uh, PowerPoint and video, which looks at the Second oh, Spanish Republic.